This video is just going to introduce coupling in proton and MR spectra, uh, where it comes from, and how to interpret simple multiplets. So fundamentally, coupling is what happens when spins of nuclei which are bonded close to each other in different chemical environments interact with each other, and it splits the signal. So if we look at a signal which is not split, it's not coupling to anything, uh, we refer to that as a singlet, and it appears as a single peak in our proton and MR spectrum. So if we give an example molecule up here, these protons in green are not close enough to any other chemical environments to cause any splitting of the signal, so these protons would appear as a singlet. We've then got what I've called simple multiplets, um, which is where your, your protons are coupling to one other chemical environment, um, which is sufficiently close enough to cause coupling. So if we look at these uh, purple protons on the end, they are close enough to one other chemical environment in the form of these two protons here, so they will couple with only that chemical environment and that will give us a simple multiplet. We've then got what I call compound multiplets, which is where we're coupling to more than one other chemical environment. So an example here would be this uh, proton in kind of ready purple up here. Um, so there are two chemical environments on either side of this proton which are different. So this chemical environment is different to this one. So this um, ready purple proton is within range of them both and it will couple to them both individually. And that will give us what I call a compound multiplet. Finally, we have complex multiplets, and these may be um, just because you've got a, an incredibly complex compound multiplet, or they might be caused by multiple signals overlapping with each other, or that your molecule is undergoing conformational changes on the NMR timescale, so you're getting kind of overlap of multiple um, spectra from different compounds, if you like. So these ones are very difficult to interpret without kind of complex computational methods, so we're not going to touch uh, too heavily on these. Um, but we'll, we'll go through each of these um, either in this video or other videos in the series. So starting with simple multiplets, um, this is where we get what we call the n plus 1 rule. So the number of peaks is n plus 1, where n is the number of nuclei in the chemical environment you're coupling to. And remember, for a simple multiplet, we're only coupling to one other chemical environment. So if we look at this molecule down here, uh, we're looking at the signal for the purple protons here. Um, there's no other protons in different chemical environments which are within range um, for this to undergo any coupling. Um, so we've got oxygens that are blocking the adjacent positions, and the methyl groups on the end are too far away. So we won't get any um, coupling here. So the number of nuclei in the chemical environments that we're coupling to, or not in this case, is zero. So zero plus one gives us a single peak, which is a singlet. If we change the molecule now and put a proton uh, in a different chemical environment but within range to couple with, so the purple protons can now couple with this orange one, uh, we've now got one adjacent proton. Um, so one plus one gives us two, so a doublet is what we call a, uh, a signal which has two peaks in it. And if we go for a slightly more complex example, we've now got two protons in the adjacent environment. So our n is two, two plus one is three, and that gives us a triplet signal, and so on and so forth for more complicated examples. So the more protons you have in this adjacent chemical environment, the more peaks you'll end up with in your uh, signal. So the thing to note is that the peaks are evenly spaced in a simple multiplet. So obviously the doublet's only got one gap, but when we go on to triplets and so on, um, this gap here between the left and the middle peak is exactly the same size as the gap between the middle and the right peak. And if we go on to quintet, for example, this peak, this gap between these two peaks, this gap, this gap, and this gap are all the same size, and that will become important later. Now, you'll notice that the peaks have different intensities. So in a doublet, it's approximately 1 to 1. In a triplet, it's 1 to 2 to 1. In a quartet, it's 1 to 3 to 3 to 1, and so on. And these are predictable uh, using something called Pascal's triangle. So how Pascal's triangle works is if we take our original signal, which I've denoted as a singlet here, and we kind of split it, um, but we, we split it additively. So we, we take a one and we split it into two ones below. Um, this gives us our, our signal intensity ratio for the next um, splitting down. So a doublet is one to one in terms of um, signal intensity. Now, if we do this again, 
we now start to meet in the middle. So if we take this one and we create a one on this side and a one on that side, and we take this one and we create a one on this side and a one on that side, these two ones add together to become a two. So we end up with a one to two to one triplet, and that's reflected in the signal intensity of the triplet. And if we just go again, we split the two now, so we push a two in this direction and a two in that direction, that adds up with the one, which is going in either of these directions, so we end up with a three in the middle, so one to three to three to one is the signal intensity of a quartet, and again that's reflected. And you can continue doing this down the range of um, simple multiplets, and that gives you an accurate signal intensity, and that's reflected in your NMR spectra. So, where do multiplets arise from? And this links back to the theory. So what we've got here is a uh, proton HA, and it's connected somehow to proton HB. And this is usually through two to four bonds. Um, two to three is typical. Um, you, most couplings go through two to three bonds. There are some rare occasions where you can get four bond coupling, but it's not um, commonplace. So um, I've just uh, denoted the spin of the nuclei as this arrow here. Um, if any of this looks a bit strange, you can go back and watch my videos on uh, NMR theory to see what's going on. So there's two possible arrangements we can have for this system. We can either have the two spins aligned with each other, um, either both up or both down, um, they're, they're the same. Or we can have the spins opposed, so one up, one down, or one down, one up. So if we remember that a spinning nucleus generates its own small magnetic field, and I've, I've expressed the magnetic field of HA here as being obviously pointing in the same direction as the spin, um, then if we've got the spins aligned, the magnetic field of HB points in the same direction. And we end up with this region in the middle here where the magnetic field is reinforced, it interacts constructively. And if you remember from the, the theory videos, the stronger the magnetic field your nucleus experiences, um, the more de-shielded it is. So the, the further to the left on the spectrum it appears. So if we take our original signal for HA, this is where this is the chemical shift that it would appear at if it weren't coupling to anything. Um, this, this scenario here is effectively de-shielding A, so it's moving the signal slightly to the left, slightly to higher ppm on the spectrum. If we now look at the spins opposed situation, right, the magnetic field of B is opposing the magnetic field of A, and we end up with this region of destructive interference in the middle, it's weakening the magnetic field around A, which is effectively shielding it. So, same scenario, this is the chemical shift of the uncoupled uh, nucleus, it's going to move the signal slightly further um, to the right, slightly further to lower ppm. Now, <clears throat> when we talked about population excess and that kind of thing in the in the, the theory video, we said that it's it's approximate. There is a population excess, but it's very very small. Um, and approximately fifty percent of nuclei are in one spin state, and approximately fifty percent of nuclei are in the other spin state. So your odds of being in each of these scenarios is pretty much fifty fifty. So therefore, when we get this uh, final signal. It's a one-to-one -one doublet. So this is one of your spin states, and this is the other spin state. And your odds of being in each one is about 50-50, so your doublet therefore has a one-to-one -one intensity, and that's where it comes from. So <clears throat> an important piece of notation to, to understand is what we call the coupling constant, and it's essentially, on a theory level, it's the energy gap between this state over here, where the spins are aligned, and this uh, state over here, where the spins are opposed. And it's given a value j, and we sometimes call it the j value, and it's measured in hertz. And we can actually measure this from the spectrum because it's the gap between these two signals here, um, but again measured in hertz. And we'll see how we interpret that later, because obviously the, the x-axis in um, proton and MR spectra is measured in ppm, so we'll see how we convert to hertz uh, later on. So if we go for a more complex example, we're going to couple to two equivalent nuclei here. We can arrange the spins in four different ways. <clears throat> so either both of our nuclei, our B nuclei that we're coupling with, are with the spin of A, uh, in which case A is uh, de-shielded, like it was before, or they could both be against, in which case A is shielded, like it was before, or we've got these um, possibilities in the middle, where one B is aligned with and one B is aligned against. And there's two different ways that we can arrange this. We either have up, down, or we have down, up. 
So in these uh, scenarios here, the two B spins cancel each other out, and therefore A doesn't experience any shielding or deshielding. It stays exactly where it was. So the odds of being in these states is 1 to 2 to 1, because the odds of being in any of these states is equal. So you've got kind of 1, 1, 1, 1. But because these two are equivalent, it becomes essentially 1 to 2 to 1. And that's our triplet. So here we have the signal for the these two states, um, where the signal's neither shielded nor deshielded. And this is the chemical shift that, you know, it hasn't changed from if it was a singlet. And then we've got these two signals on the other side, one where it's been shielded, uh, deshielded, and one where it's been shielded. So that's why our triplet gives us a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. And just a bit to um, note here that the J values, you can measure either of these gaps, but it's the adjacent um, peaks that you need to measure. So don't measure from the, the blue one to the red one. That would give you 2J. Um, it's, it's the gap between the adjacent peaks in the signal. So you can either measure this gap here between the blue and the grey, or you can measure this gap here between the grey and the red. Either is fine, and they should be the same because the peaks are evenly spaced. I'll show you one final example with a more complicated system, so now we're coupling to three equivalent Bs. We've now got a bit of a spectrum from uh, deshielding uh, spin states to shielding spin states, so obviously we can have all of our Bs in the aligned position or all of our Bs in the anti-aligned position and then kind of everything in between. And if we think about how many arrangements we've got, there's only one possible arrangement you can have where all of them are aligned and similarly. <clears throat> where they're all uh, opposed, but you can have three possible arrangements of two up, one down, and three possible arrangements of one up, two down. So that gives us our uh, odds of being in each case, because it's, it's an equal split. So we end up with a quartet with single intensity one to three to three to one. And we, we, as I said before, we've now got this spectrum between de-shielding and shielding. <clears throat> so this arrangement here shields it quite heavily, so the signal moves quite far. This, signal, this uh, arrangement here, produces a slight shielding effect, so it moves it a little bit, and so on and so forth. And you can see how the signal uh, then arises. And once again, you can measure the J value from this signal. So again, it's the gap between adjacent peaks, and they should all be the same. Um, sometimes you measure all of them and take the average just to be, to be accurate, but they should all be absolutely identical. So an important thing to remember is that nuclei coupling to each other have identical coupling constants. So if we look at these purple protons up here, they're obviously coupling to the yellow protons and vice versa. Then the J value for these uh, purple protons, which I've taken just by measuring this gap here, um, and I've arbitrarily said it's 7.8 hertz, which is about right for this sort of system. Um, if you were to measure the J value of this triplet, which is being caused by the uh, orange protons, then it should also be absolutely the same, 7.8 hertz. Now you might notice that your, your J values are slightly different, so one might be 8 hertz and one might be 7.8, or one might be 8 and one might be 8.2. Um, that's to do with the uh, experimental error in the spectrometer. It's to do with the resolution of the spectrometer. On an infinitely uh, powerful and uh, a spectrometer that's got perfect resolution, they should be absolutely identical. But you might get a little bit of variation, uh, but that's just to do with the spectrometer. So how do we calculate J from a spectrum? Because I said before that the, you know, the, the axis on your spectrum is going to be in ppm, it's going to be in chemical shift. So how do we get it into hertz? Well, the equation is that the J value in hertz <clears throat> is equal to the difference in chemical shift, so delta chemical shift, times by the resonance frequency in megahertz. And that's the, the rating of your instrument, if you like. So for example, this quartet we recorded on a 600 megahertz instrument. And on your spectrum, you'll quite often see the peak labels, which are obviously measured in chemical shift. So chemical shift of 6.81 ppm and so on. So if we take the gap between any two of these signals, um, so I've just calculated this one. Um, so the gap between these two signals is 0 0.0138 ppm. And like I said before, you can measure any of these gaps. They should all be the same. Um, but due to the experimental error that there might be in the, in, from the instruments, you, you're quite often better off measuring all three and then taking an average. Um, but if we do this equation, so we, we basically take the, the difference in ppm, times it by the megahertz rating of the instrument, which is 600 in this case, and we end up with our answer in hertz. So 8.3 hertz is the J value for this system. 
Now, this is how it works for simple multiplets, right? So you're, the gap that you're measuring is adjacent peaks, so the peaks that are directly next to each other. When we come on to things like compound multiplets, that is not always the case. So it's not always the adjacent signals that you're measuring. So um, when you watch the later video on compound multiplets, just bear in mind that this is only the case for simple multiplets like doublets, triplets, quartets, and so on. When we get onto compound multiplets, you'll have to think hard about which signals you need to measure between to calculate J values. And a final point, just on coupling constant notation, um, they're generally expressed like this, where you've got a J, um, which is italicized, and then N is probably the most important part of this, but we'll come on to what that means, and then just some kind of label. So N is the number of bonds that the coupling is occurring through, and that's a really common uh, way of notating this, and we'll refer to that in other videos as well, so it's good to get used to it now. X and Y are just... Um, labels so they could be whatever you want they could be x y one and two smiley face sad face as long as it labels the nuclei which are interacting you can call it whatever you like really so look at, the, at this example down here we've got two nuclei which i've labeled hx and hy so the labels are accurate so if we're looking at the coupling between these two nuclei you would call it j x y they're just the labels to show you which nuclei are coupling to each other and then we need to work out um, how many j this is, what the n value is. So if we look at how many bonds the, the coupling is occurring through, it's occurring through 1, 2, 3. So this is a 3j coupling. So one final example, just to look at this system over here and see how we notate all of the three couplings that are occurring here. So h1 to h2, which is this coupling that's going across here, is occurring through 1, 2 bonds. So this is a 2J coupling. H1 and H3 are 1, 2, 3 bonds apart. So this is a 3J coupling. And H2 and H3, again, are coupling through 3 bonds. So that's a 3J coupling as well. And you'll see couplings notated as this in chemical papers, research papers, synthetic chem chemistry papers all over the place.